In this episode, I have Mark Fisher from Mark Fisher Fitness and Business for Unicorns. He is the owner and he's an amazing and very successful human being. I am super excited to have him because he's going to show you how he's super, super productive every single day and how he got from absolutely nothing to all the way to many millions of dollars in New York City with his niche market that he created for himself. Welcome back to another amazing episode of the FitBiz Journey podcast. Guys, I'm back in New York City and I have Mark Fisher here from Mark Fisher Fitness and Business from Unicorns. Just real quick, it's one of the most amazing things that I have stumbled upon, I would say about a year ago in Forbes article. I believe that's yeah. how I find yeah. you guys a long time ago. Well, a year ago. But I could not believe it, what I have read. The, your growth, your model, um, the experience. I was just like blown away and I right away researched you guys and I looked up um, Business for Unicorns, which is an amazing place and tool, whatever you want to call it. It's really amazing for business owners, personal trainers, to get some business know-hows the right way. We yeah. were actually part of it for almost a year. Yeah, yeah. And man. we loved it, it was amazing. And guys, make sure to check it out. But without further ado, Mark Fisher, welcome on our podcast. Thanks so much. <laughs> Hello, humans. <laughs> and yes, Mark is an amazing character. So this will be a very, very entertaining <laughs> episode. He's gonna say weird things. <laughs> yeah, I totally forgot <laughs> to mention that, but everybody. But it's gonna be a really cool episode. So, so thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me, man. And I know you're super busy and guys, by the way, if you thought that I'm also all about the time and the management and, uh, you know, write down what I do every day and that kind of stuff. Well, Mark is another level on that too. And I actually just asked him a few days ago for this podcast purpose too, um, to send me his schedule and he sent me his schedule and it was pretty awesome to see that he has a daily routine that he follows. Of course, it might be different when you travel, right? Sure. But it's just amazing to see that all these amazing high performers have an amazing uh, daily yeah. habit. When did you start that? Yeah, I think it's funny. I th really, when Mark Fisher Fitness started, I think I got in the habit of doing things in a consistent way because what I found was when I was consistent with my schedule, I was very happy with the outcomes I was getting. And if there was no structure to my day, I had a feeling of not being able to keep track of all of the things. So it really happened, I think, when Mark Fisher Fitness first started. I think a couple years organically got more and more structured. I would say it really probably locked in like maybe four years ago or so. And it sounds like similar to you, I'm forever in the process of just tweaking those dials just a little bit based on what's going on at that moment, what my goals are, uh, what's making me happiest. And I realize a lot of people having a very structured day as working with a lot of people on time management, I have learned <laughs> many people feel very constrained by too much structure in their day. So I find it's an interesting phenomenon because it's, it's actually not in like, I think there are a lot of parallels to working with clients. If clients do nutrition with them, uh, many of them, if it's overly prescriptive, if it's overly directive, they would rebel against it. So I find it's an interesting puzzle to figure out how does an individual get the right structure for them, that they feel good about it, they feel like it's autonomously chosen, and they're getting good outcomes. And I would note that I am somebody that has a very high, not only tolerance for structure, but love of structure. Mm -hmm. I think my favorite quote I've heard about that, Gustave Flaubert said, uh, I'm gonna paraphrase it, uh, he said, I am, uh, I am orderly and measured in my life, so I can be violent and original in my work, and <laughs> that feels very true to me. <laughs> That's awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. And uh, you also have a course on it, though, by the way, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So we have a course. Okay. Uh, it's been called Historically Time Ninja. Name might be changing here soon. Uh, it, is, it is a project that I love so, so much, mm -hmm. and it's something I'm considering spending even more time on. But yeah, if you go to bizfeenicorns.com, if you look on our courses page, you'll find a time management course, which is currently called Time Ninja as of now. And, and by the way, it's pretty awesome because um, I'm all over my schedule and I love everything what you just said. But when I went to the Time Ninja course, it was what I loved the most, which I was not, not transferring. So whatever you did, let's say today, and if yeah. you haven't done it, then you technically transfer it over to the next day. There's a box of things that you... Yes. And I didn't do that before. I was oh, like, wow. okay, cool. uh, what That's I did is I emailed myself to remind myself and I would yeah. put it into a schedule somewhere else. Yeah. But now I have a section in my uh, journal right. just for that. Right. And it's, I was like, why didn't I do that before? That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you know, it's one of the things I love about time management. It's it, what I think I find so satisfying about it is oftentimes if I find just a little bit of an efficiency, mm -hmm. 
those small hinges swing enormous doors because if you save a few seconds a day oh, yeah. over the course of a lifetime, you start to compound that. Like it really matters, you know. Do you do you know right now by heart that what did you tell me on, about the uh, was it the espresso or what oh, was the it? The coffee. The oh coffee? yeah, yeah. That yeah. my favorite headline is how your coffee inefficiencies are stealing money out of your pocket and robbing your children of time. Uh, <laughs> so the the metaphor that I always use, and I want to attribute this to the. Uh, an author who wrote a book called Two Second Lean, mm -hmm. which is about, it may be a little nerdy and out of scope for people watching this, but it's actually about lean manufacturing processes, which are very important in factories and industrial settings, but applied to personal productivity. And the author makes the point that if you drink coffee in the morning, mm -hmm. so hypothetically drink coffee, and maybe, maybe you like sugar and maybe you like some cream. So for most people, they'll brew their coffee, they'll get their mug, then they'll take their coffee, they'll pour it in, then they'll take like a, a teaspoon of uh, sugar in it, then they'll pour a little cream in it, then they'll put the spoon in, and then they'll stir it. And then of course, they'll have to dispose of the spoon, they'll have to put it in the sink, maybe rinse it off then, maybe they wash it right then, at some point it gets dried, maybe it goes in the dishwasher, and at some point the spoon goes back in the drawer. However, if you do the same thing and just put the sugar and the milk in first and then pour the coffee on top, you don't have to stir. And I realize that, that level of granularity might sound terrifying and crazy town for many people. But understand, if you say, hypothetically, let's say that's going to save you, and I can't remember the exact numbers off the top of my head, if that saves you 15 seconds per day, it's literally several weeks of your life if you market that out for the yep. length of a lifetime. On, a, on just a spoon, spooning yeah, your coffee. Spoon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And of course, the goal is never to make people, you know, you don't want to make people like overly compulsive yeah, and like constantly freaking out about their widgets. But the reality is so, um, <laughs> the reality is, I mean, it's just so much love. Pe there are very few people that are so close to over optimizing, getting compulsive. Most people have put so little thought to being intentional mm -hmm. about their personal workflow processes that there are huge gains of productivity and not just getting more stuff done, but peace of mind because mm -hmm. things are in its place and people have created order out of the chaos of their life. That I want to add to that 100% because um, when I came to New York City, I might have told you this, but I had my routine in Florida where basically I lived right. and I would literally only go to the grocery store one day and that day I also, I found a grocery store that has the post office next to it, has a UPS right. and has um, basically dry cleaning everything that I need. So I wouldn't only have to drive there once Perfect. and don't go there every day or like, because I save so much time. I yeah. just calculated it. I recommend, I'm pretty sure you, or what would you recommend for a person? who would come on the, uh, who let's say go to the Ninja course and I think because you had a recommendation on how to audit yourself and then yeah. go on from there. Oh yeah, one of my favorite activities I think for a lot of people, there are a couple different ways you can do it. So it's like anything else and again, think about this, if you want to contextualize this, think about your clients, particularly as it relates to food. There, there are some parallels with training, but if you think about your clients and the way they eat, you got to kind of start by understanding what they're eating right now, right? So for most people, I think it's helpful to do what's called a time audit. So the exercise we have people do, and you can find this is a, just a free article on bizfreeunicorns.com. If you just go to the articles and you search audit, you'll be able to find it and it'll, it'll break it down for you. But basically, you just sit down, you write down everything that you do in a given week. You include personal stuff too. So it's maybe time training clients, per, writing programs, doing sales calls, but also showering, cooking food, sleeping, commuting. You write down every single thing you think you do. And then you want to guesstimate about how much time you're spending on that in a week in 15 minute increments. Right. And for most people, it gets very, very sobering because most people know, most, not everybody, but most people have some sense of, okay, here's the most important thing I can be doing. And sometimes you find the most important thing I can be doing, I'm spending 30 minutes per week on yeah. and I'm watching <laughs> Netflix for three hours every week. Yep. I am not here to judge, you're in charge of your life, you get to decide if that's reflective of your values, but for most people, that information can be sobering. Yep. An alternative version of that exercise, which I would offer to anybody that is inspired to try this, just like our clients are not great at self-reported data with their nutrition if they wait a week and then write it down, an oh, yeah. alternative way of doing this is you could either do this on the Notes app on your phone, there are some apps to do this, or if you're like me and you live a laptop life, you can just open up a Google Doc on your browser and just for three days, five days, maybe seven days, keep a log in 15 minute increments in real time of how long you're spending on stuff. Mm -hmm. And you will find, the downside with that is it's a little bit more onerous, it takes a little bit longer, but the plus side is you're gonna get better data because 
what will be hilarious is when if you just do the 45 minute one, which is still very valuable, when you do the math of it, you'll find that your week has like 110 hours or 256 hours, and there are only 168 hours in the week. So if you, when you're doing the self-reported data, there's going to be a lot of, uh, and I mean this not as a judgment, there's going to be a lot of slop in it. So oh, yeah. either of those are useful. And then once you've got that, then I think you begin to have another conversation. Okay, like how would you change that in a perfect world? And then all these time management skills become useful. I remember that what you just said in the classroom too in Las Vegas. They, um, lots of people said, "Oh, it's 2:40." Or <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, something yeah, gets yeah, off. Yeah, obviously. yeah. <laughs> and you know, to be clear, there's definitely still yep. value in it, right? And you're yep. still getting like, more awareness than you had. Oh yeah. And I do think you know you consider the pros cons. The the latter way I offered is going to be more onerous, but the data is a little bit more useful. Um, and one thing for somebody that identifies first and foremost as a, like an artist creative kind of person. I love tracking. I love being methodical and intentional. That's awesome. And, and uh, everybody can do that because it's totally. just crazy amount of, well, it's just money. When you don't track the money, don't track your time, don't track your workout, all yeah. those things, yeah. same thing, yeah. same yeah. rule. Yeah. It's utterly, and it's interesting, the same, and the, I might have read this somewhere, but if not, somebody I'm sure has said this before me. But if you really think about it, part of the way I look at the world is through the lens of these like core human disciplines, one of which is evolutionary psychology. Mm -hmm. We are designed perfectly for a world that no longer exists. <laughs> and in the ancestral evolutionary environment, there was no reason to track how much food you ate that week. You just ate as much sugary, salty, fatty food as you could. Yeah. There was no reason to be cognizant of how much time you're spending on things. You just spend the time you spend. And money was something that didn't even exist mm. until relatively recent in the development of humans. So because of that, our brains are just not good at quantifying that stuff. And money, of course, is interesting because money, the banks will take care of it for you. So it might be disappointing when you look at your bank account, you're like, oh no, I can't believe I spent all that money. But at least the bank is doing it. Whereas with the time, there's not really yeah, no anything way. to keep you accountable unless you even take the moment to do that intentionally. Yep. I think most people are probably have some ways that even if they rebel against a lot of the structure that I personally find satisfying, probably have some meaningful ways that they can make some changes that will not only allow them to be more effective in their work, but more importantly, have more time for whatever it is they want to do, you know, just like have unstructured time with loved ones. So do you think that um, when you started Mark Fisher Fitness, you have not done this just yet, right? Or did you have yes. the time management done already? Uh, it's funny, I can't quite remember. I don't think I had the level of rigor by that point. I had my notebook by that point, so my trusty system, because when I think about time management, another like big structure that if you think about it, any, any system has, because these are inarguable principles of a time management system, there needs to be some depository to capture information, capture ideas, capture to-dos. There needs to be some system moment for analyzing those to-dos, those projects, whatever, if you're gonna do them, not gonna do them, when you're gonna do them. And then at some point, ideally, they have to exist in a calendar. They have to be transferred, so they're scheduled to be done at a certain time. I don't know if I was yet good at analyzing. I don't think I had the level of rigor with the scheduling at that time, but I did have like my trusty notebook because for me, I find if I don't write things down, my brain can't be present with people, mm -hmm. right? And I, like, a friend of mine gave me a great compliment recently, <laughs> was almost backhanded, was a compliment, it's like, you are unnervingly present with people when you're with them, right? And that's <laughs> because I feel like I don't have a lot of what's called open loops. So this is another thing that if you're listening, I, I want you to like, think about this in your life, because this is a known thing in the brain, it's called the Zagernik effect, named after the researchers that found it. When you think of a thing you need to do, but you don't write it down and you forget about it, your brain doesn't like that, it's an open loop. So it's like a little puppy. So imagine a hungry little puppy that unless you feed the puppy, it's gonna keep like biting at you, keep barking, and your brain is just gonna keep getting distracted by it. Whereas if you write it down in a system, even if you haven't done it yet, but you trust that system, you don't need to think about it anymore because it's captured, you'll have more presence of mind. And I don't have like data on this, but it seems reasonable to me that you are going to be freer to do more creative thinking, your brain can wander and be unstructured the way it needs to because it's not constantly being distracted by all these things you know you have to do that you're not certain you're gonna remember to do. Oh, I, I back this up 100%. By personal experience, I 100% agree with what you just said. If I don't have it right, written down, my brain is just on it, on it, on it, thinking back of my head, even when I talk to somebody or even I do a podcast. Yeah. It's so crazy, but it really works. Yeah. But when you put it down and you know, or even what, I, what helps me even more is not only I put it down, but I put 
uh, select down the week or something like a yep. time for yep. it. Yep. And you then I know it's time. done technically. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's funny, even right now, honestly, I probably should make, make a note real quick because it just <laughs> reminded me of a thing. I'm writing uh, another blog post right now, which is musings of things. And one of the things that now it's like distracting me because I'm like, oh, I need to write that down and write a note about it. The second time I thought about it is what I find interesting is as somebody that reads a lot about time management, there is this certain stream of conversation around time management, particularly in like newspapers, in magazines, with online thought leaders mm -hmm. that will often say things like, Time management doesn't work. And I find it fascinating because it's a straw man because it's always like bad time management doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You say time management is bad because you just try to fit you into a box and there's no room for your own rhythms of figuring out what time during the day you are better, more or less equipped to do certain things. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's dumb. Like nobody should be doing that. Any good time management system would take that into account. So I certainly understand the concern, but oftentimes I, I, I do think when people say, time management doesn't work, it's uh, what's called like a straw man argument, where they're like, they're trying to be contrarian and clickbaity, but then what they say is like, do this time management principle that is good, <laughs> not this other one that nobody's doing that's dumb. But I digress, I digress. So now all those things you just said about time management is obviously has to do with that why Mark Fisher Fitness is pretty successful. Yeah. But when you first started Mark Fisher Fitness, how did you even come about the idea? Yeah, I think the idea of Mark Fisher Fitness, so for, so for people not familiar, like very high level, very quickly, our tagline is Ridiculous Humans, Serious Fitness. And I was an actor who, like many actors, made a middling income <laughs> and needed to do some stuff on the side. And I was always really into fitness, but really, 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 really into fitness. In New York, there are a lot of actors that like kind of do fitness, but I was like really into fitness. I really fell in love with it. And I developed this niche in New York City in this small modest following in the Broadway community of actors that came to me for help with their fitness because I was an actor and I, I knew my stuff, I was good, I got results and I was talking about, I was like friendly, I feel like I'm pretty good at making people not feel terrified and what happened was I had reached a point in my career as an actor where I realized I didn't want to leave town anymore, I wanted to be in town. I was ready to start making some more money. And I had always had these closet entrepreneurial dreams of doing something entrepreneurial. So I decided I was gonna really commit to education in a very serious way. And that's when I began my ongoing experiment of trying to read, uh, or audiobook, mm -hmm. uh, one, two books per week, sometimes three, indefinitely. Yeah. And what happened was, when I started doing that very religiously, which, which and when I say that, everyone's always like, oh my gosh, it's like wild. But it's, it's actually not that crazy. If you consistently do it like every day, like an hour, two hours per day, like y you will be in the top point one 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 zero zero one percent of anybody doing this and yep. it will give you great advantages. So <laughs> can you do it too much? If you're not taking action, yeah, I think you probably could, but, but that wasn't the case with me. So what happened was I started feeding my brain all this information about business. And the thing that's hilarious is I was reading one book on training and nutrition and I was reading one book about business per week was my goal. Mm -hmm. And that was for acting, because I was like, well, acting is a business. If I learn about marketing, I'll get better at acting. And sure enough, it really was helpful for about three months. <laughs> but like within six months in, I had read so much, I was like, wait a minute, this is for the birds. I want to do this other thing. So the idea of Mark Fisher Fitness, I think, came out of my desire to create something for my community, for the people I wanted to work with. It was my desire, I think, to self-express, and I've always been, I think, a pretty eccentric person. And I just had so much fun, I just found it so mischievous and delightful to take like nerdy, sciencey fitness, this industry that is often about muscle and sinew and steel and iron and sweat, uh, and then make it like glittery and rain rainbows and unicorns <laughs> and panda bears and kindergartners and ayahuasca and just like just how crazy can I make it? Um, and it has been very, very satisfying because it, from a business perspective, what was useful about that, of course, was it was like purple cow. And by the mm -hmm. time this all happened, I kind of knew what that meant. So purple cow is a phrase by a marketing expert named Seth Godin, who makes the point that nobody tells their friend about a brown cow, but if they see a purple cow, they're like, what is this, it's a purple <laughs> yep. cow. So I both w w knew strategically that was useful, but I think the other reason why I think it worked was because it was authentic to who I was. I wasn't like pretending to be super eccentric. Like it just like, so actually who I was, it caused me a lot of sadness in middle school. And the people that I wanted to work with 
it was something they were like genuinely delighted by and genuinely drawn to. Because I think a lot of stuff that MFF did and continues to do would be gimmicky if it wasn't so, I think, like heartfelt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so that's kind of where the idea came from and, and about MFF. The, and guys, well, few things, three things I would say. First of all, if you don't know what MFF is, look up right now. It's, what is the website? Is it Mark uh, Fisher? MarkFisherFitness.com. Look it up right now. You will not be able to <laughs> unsee it. Exactly. That's a fair <laughs> warning. Burn your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's amazing. So I couldn't believe it. And, and I was, by the way, when I first saw it and I went to the website, I could not believe it. It was amazing and it's still amazing. And I showed it to my team and I was like, guys, look at this. Purple cup, perfect example. It's like New York City, they're killing it. I was just, if you ask anybody on our team, you will know that I was super excited uh, because it really works. I was telling yeah. everybody about the purple cup and become a KPI, key person of oh, influence. Yeah. Yeah. And also to niche down to your market. Yeah. And then there you were. And I didn't even know yeah. until I read that. Yeah. And then I found this, this guy right here and he's doing it all. It's Thanks, man. And the niche, by the way, that you have yeah. is really a niche. That's yeah. so much of a niche that it's, I don't think it gets any more niche than that. No, yeah. it's great. And yeah. it's, it's, you know, it's interesting. It's both the challenge and the opportunity of New mm -hmm. York because it's just so huge. Even yeah. when you talk about things like digital marketing, it functions uniquely than a lot of other markets. Mm -hmm. It's almost like an online spend because it's so enormous. Yep. You have to get so much more targeted with everything you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'm hyper aware you know, people often say, I think, kind of an obvious thing, which is like, well, I don't think that would work in a rural town. It's like, okay, well, I probably wouldn't have done it in a rural town. Yeah, exactly. Uh, or but Kentucky. For, yeah, exactly. Uh, but I think for our purposes, for where we are, it's worked well. And based on where you are, you're listening to this, um, I offer this nugget to you to run with because I'm not expanding to take it out of New York. Uh, and it, I encourage you to do your own thing. People have sometimes done weird faux MFF things, which I, I think has had mixed success because it's not always authentic, even though it's, uh, I believe beautifully heartfelt and inspired by MFF. I think in smaller markets, I think there's probably a lot of room for people to be even more successful as an MFF style mm -hmm. thing. Now, it might not be as far as MFF, but if you are in, uh, I think, like a market, like let's say like 10th to 90th biggest cities in America, all of those cities will tend to have a certain counterculture neighborhood. There will be some kind of arts scene. There will be a particular area of the city that's a little more counterculture. They will often have at least one or two alternative newspapers, which is often a free weekly. And you just find where like the other weirdos are and go there. Um, because in New York, uh, as well as we've done, you know, at, at, there's a lot of weird stuff going on here. You know, So we kind of had to hit at a high level. But this could be an actionable thing for somebody listening. If if anything we've said is resonates with you, based on your market, it might be like actually a great strategy to turn up your authentic weirdness. It's hundred percent. And where where did you um, or let's say when you first opened, which location was the first one? Uh, Hell's Kitchen. Hell's Kitchen. How long has been open? How <sighs> Boy, we're coming up on our ninth year now. Wow, ninth yeah. year. Wow, yeah, that's awesome. And. Um, well, so that was the first one, and then the second one is. Yep. And then we open up Bowery, which will be coming up on its Bowery fourth year. Fourth year. Wow. Oh, no, I guess third full year. It'll come up on third full year. And um, which one was more successful? Because I assume when you first started, yeah, um, you probably I don't know if you made any mistakes, but most people do make mistakes, right? Yeah. So was the second one more successful a startup than the first one, or it was about the same? Uh, you know, the first one actually went faster. The second one took us longer to get traction mm -hmm. because we didn't know the neighborhood as well. There were Got just, uh, uh, where the first one was, the thing that we did well, which could be a thing to steal, particularly if you're a personal trainer, you don't have your own space yet, mm -hmm. is we had been renting space. We didn't have any overhead, mm -hmm. but over the course of 2011, First, I already had a pretty big book of people I had worked with at some point over the previous years. For whatever reason, you know, I had the good sense to really curate an email and a contact list and keep in touch mm -hmm. with people on a regular basis, which is another pro tip. If you're a trainer, certainly a gym owner, but if you're a trainer, you're, if you're not keeping a list of your unconverted prospects, your former clients, and your current clients, that is like your lifeblood because you will, yeah. many of those people will become your clients if they haven't already or if they're not currently. So I had done that. And then in 2011, as Snatch grew, uh, we did a six week makeover program called Snatch in six weeks. Mm -hmm. The first round, we did two sessions of 10 people. Mm -hmm. Then I think it was like three sessions of 10 people. Then it was five of 10. Then I think it was eight of 10. And in the last round, we did 10 of 10. Wow. So over the course of that year, we literally worked with probably 200 people between Snatched, my own personal training, and then our first team members' personal training clients. 
So when we opened, we knew we had a base. It was still a dice roll. We still didn't know would these people mm -hmm. want to do a membership model and go mm -hmm. do lots of classes as well as move from one-on-one -on -one to semi-private. And in our model, we do up to three people at a time. Uh, and it worked out really well. The thing that I think we also did that was smart in the beginning was we knew that we were lucky. <laughs> that's, not, that's not to say that we didn't do a lot of things right, but we kind of knew the first year and a half, like things just went gangbusters for like really the first like two years, we had like almost no issues other than how do we handle all this growth, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that was great. And we had the good sense to realize like, things were gonna flatten it out for a minute. Uh, anybody that reads a business book or a story of an entrepreneur, you will see very quickly, you're gonna have kind of tough times. And right. sometimes I think a challenge I've seen in some, for some people is they hit it really hard outside the gate mm -hmm. and they think they're a genius and maybe they are some, doing some things right. Yep. But all of us have, have painful things that will come to us. Sometimes it's because we make mistakes. Sometimes it's because just the market changes. Mm -hmm. So I think, we were fortunate enough to keep a humility that when the tough times came, and we've had some tough times over the past mm -hmm. few years, we were always level-headed about it and never freaked out about it because we were just like, oh yeah, it's like, this is not ideal right now, like whatever, we'll figure it out. Yep, that's a good mindset to have. Yeah. Uh, I can just give one example too, if you don't prepare or anything, that we had the hurricanes in Florida. Yeah. So anytime that can yeah. happen. <laughs> yeah. So, and you're closed for weeks, sometimes months. Yeah, for real. Yeah. For so, real. but yeah, so that's a huge advice that I would, run with that always be prepared and then be uh, what's the word for it you just said it actually be uh, modest or uh, humble humble there we go <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah 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 and uh, so what would be like the number one takeaway that in the past nine years yeah. that you have learned as a you can say both ways either to a personal trainer or for basically a gym owner what would mm -hmm. be like the number one mm -hmm. takeaway wow i'll give two very different ones the first one for trainers also relates to gym owners is that literally no one cares what you know, they don't care about your certs. Mm -hmm. They don't even care about, this is very provocative, their results so much as they care about, do I feel cared for? Do I feel supported? Mm -hmm. Do I generally like you? Do, do you make me feel better after I spend time with you? Or do I feel worse? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a very famous story in the lore of Precision Nutrition, which is an amazing online nutrition company, and uh, was run by one of my mentors, uh, this very wonderful, smart, kind fellow, Dr. John Berardi. And he always tells the story about lurking in on online review sites and finding somebody saying, don't go to Precision Nutrition. I didn't have a good time there. They, just, they didn't really know what they were doing. And of course, John's a very savvy guy, very savvy business guy. So he's like, all right, well, let me find out what happens to this individual. Goes and looks at her data and comes to find out she lost like, I'm, and I'm maybe fudging some of the numbers, but she lost like 50 pounds over the year. Mm -hmm. But she was like, yeah, I just felt like it was generic. I felt like they didn't really see oh. me. So she got this amazing, unbelievable yeah, result with the best she could get, but she didn't feel seen and supported. Right. And I think by all means, we should be great at what we're doing as trainers and professionals, but learning how to build rapport, learning how to be great at customer service, be great at connecting with people is so, so key, not only for your long-term professional success and your ability to make money, that's part of it, but also for long-term behavior change. Because one thing we know is it's very difficult to change behaviors outside the context of the community. So having a guide, having a coach, having someone that will, yes, hold you accountable, but will also will see you and uh, treat you with unconditional positive regard sets the stage for professional, financial, emotional success of all the kinds. Mm -hmm. So I think both trainers and uh, business owners would benefit from that. And if anybody wants to nerd out more about that, plug alert, uh, <laughs> they go to businessforunicorns.com and go to our courses page. Mm -hmm. uh, the coaching conversations course we run that my business partner facilitates is designed very specifically to teach the skills of how one facilitates the types of conversations that help people feel seen, feel unstuck, feel cared for. Mm -hmm. Because some people are naturally intuitive at that, some people are not. Uh, and even the people that are intuitive at it, I think they're, you can sharpen your saw by reverse engineering and develop a technique, developing a system around what you might do naturally. Because a lot of that stuff, sometimes we think of coaching conversations, sometimes, particularly in my experience, very intelligent uh, trainers that tend to like live in the quote unquote left brain, analytical people feel sometimes like, oh, it's like kind of woo, we're talking about feelings, like I just told them what to do, why don't they do what I told them to do, you know? And I, I can relate to some of that, so I have empathy for that in that situation. Um, and what I have learned is that everybody can learn these skills. It's not, it's not a woo, it is a process, it's a particular type 
of guiding conversation in a way that's going to lead to predictable positive outcomes for your clients. Mm -hmm. So that's my tra uh, trainer and business owner amazing. bucket. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and my, my business owner bucket, oh gosh, there's so many things I could say, but this is something in real time we're working on a solve right now for MFF because the MFF has some really beautiful flaws mm -hmm. because when we designed it, we didn't know what we were doing. I wasn't thinking about mm -hmm. anything. I wasn't thinking about scale. I was just like, this feels like the right thing to do. And what happens is for a lot of people in their first business, you build in a lot of complexity and it comes from a great place because MFF is a very individualized place. I wouldn't change any of it. And that shows up in a lot of ways that are great in the short term for the clients, but challenging for the business as a whole. Mm -hmm. So for instance, our rack cart is like way too complicated. There's too many memberships. There's too many things they can do and it's fine. It's going okay. But in retrospect, if I were to do it all again and launch another concept, one thing I would do is keep that simple, simple, simple. Another thing internally that I think was well-intentioned and not actually correct was uh, I have read a lot about psychology. I'm very inspired by proponents of something called self-determination theory, which is a framework of psychology and basically it means humans have three core needs. So when you think about this, three things that you need, right? And these are the, the people that are hardcore about this theory will say they're not wants. You need to feel like you're autonomous, like you've got some control in your life. You need to feel like you're competent, that you're good at stuff and you, nobody likes to feel like they're bad at things. And then lastly, we wanna feel like we're in a community, that we're related, we care about each other, we're cared for. And the first piece is really sticky because for a lot of people's autonomy, what we've seen, if you look in the literature, when you incentivize people with money, with cash bonuses, a lot of times it crushes their creativity. So it seems to work very well for things like data processing where it's just a linear thing, they'll do more of it if they get more money for it. But when you're looking to have people think creatively, create creatively, it seems that in a lot of a lot of situations, incentivizing with bonuses, with commissions, can stunt some of that creativity and hurt something they otherwise might want to have done intrinsically. Well, now think, well, now you're trying to control me tit for tat, putting a camera in front of my face, and I think that is true. I still believe that, and I think incentives matter. And I think one thing we didn't get right at MFF and we're working on some things that might adjust this is because everybody is paid on salary and nobody really owns sales, mm -hmm. that's a real challenge. So people are still willing to do a lot of things uh, because they're the, they're the best. Like my team is the best. They're doing it because like they're told to do it. They're good soldiers. We tell them to do a new thing. They'll do their very best. But right now, through no fault of their own, they don't have skin in the game. They don't really see any benefit for them personally. Mm -hmm. So we have made the mistake. The inverse is what Ben Franklin would recommend. We have appealed to their reason, but not to their enlightened self-interest. Mm -hmm. And again, they're doing really, really well, but that's something that I would, I would offer as a business owner, as a trainer, if you decide to ever grow a team, think in advance about how you get some incentive in there. I still think you know, there's a, there's a balance. I don't know that you want like, I don't like kill what you eat, like mercenary, like boiler room sales person based on your, maybe you do based on your culture, you get to decide that. But I think in retrospect, I don't know that I would ever do a business again where I didn't structure it in a way so that key meaningful stakeholders don't get a piece of the upside and aren't gonna have a little the, forgive the expression, pain if things go awry, if they're not performing the way that the organization needs them to. Wow, that's, so that was awesome. And, and by the way, we did the same thing. So everybody's okay. salary placed in our place. <laughs> yeah. So we can probably talk about okay, that. Okay, great, so tell me what to do. But, uh, <laughs> but I agree with yeah. what you said. And, uh, and, but I did it too, I was the same way at first that that I think this is the best way to do it because we take care of our people. Yeah. You know? And then, you know, what you just said is also makes sense. It's, yeah. It really was yeah. a, it was kind of a bitter pill to swallow, Frank, because I kicked and screamed so long about it because I was so entrenched in that mindset. And then the past six months, I've just I'd aggressively been studying mm -hmm. Charlie Munger, mm -hmm. who is Warren Buffett's business partner. Yep. And that's, if there's like one of the five like most important things that Munger just over and over and over again is like you gotta get the incentives right. Yep. And what makes this challenging is it's like very hard to get the incentives right. Because yep. you also have to think through the second and third order impact of that. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes you accidentally incentivize other behavior that goes awry. Yep. So the famous example people use, I don't know, this might be apocryphal, I don't know if this is factually true, but the story is that in British controlled India, the government noticed snakes were out of hand. They're like, ah, oh, we gotta get rid of these snakes. 
let's incentivize people. We'll pay them for every time they kill a snake and bring us the head. So what happened was everybody started breeding snakes because then they were able to make more money, right? Yeah, yeah. So the thing about incentives also that I think got in our way, because we tried a thing in the beginning and, and it, it got kind of messed up and I take ownership of that, you have to think through like the second and third order consequences because otherwise you'll incentivize the wrong behavior. And then the other thing that I now believe to be true, they'll never be 100% perfect. There's always gonna be a little bit of a quirky quirky, but you can't stop just the first like, oh, if I need more money, then do to do. You also have to think through the second and third order consequences of how that might impact clients, how that might impact team members. So uh, unfortunately it is as complicated as it sounds, yes. but it's not beyond you to figure it out and I think uh, taking that very seriously is important if you really want your business to consistently thrive and you don't have to be the personally one to be the rainmaker, which is certainly my vision. It's not wrong, a lot of people, I love operating MFF, but I take pride that I have a business that like doesn't, it's like my college kid, it's like, I love it, he needs me, but like, he doesn't care if I'm not there. Like yep. some days he'd rather me not be there anyway because he's trying to smoke pot with his friends. Get out of here, dad. Um, so yeah. Guys, by the way, the coaching conversations, make sure you do look it up and do purchase, do sign up because they do sell out. I believe a few months ago I was, um, I even, some of you went, some of our listeners, so thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much, Chico. And I was actually gonna be signing up for it too and I was like, I called Michael because I couldn't anymore. Oh. And Michael's like, oh, sorry, it's actually uh, sold out. And I was like, ah, oh, great, thank you. <laughs> yeah. It's, but, so signed up. <laughs> yeah, I have to say it's been interesting too because something that, that we've been discussing is you know we're considering maybe trying to offer more of these because mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting in that it's not, I think, always obvious to everybody immediately what the value is, but it's the people, I've never had this, this crazy feedback of maybe any project we've ever done to people that take that course with Michael. Yeah, Good. and I don't have anything to do with it, so it's not me bragging, it's him. <laughs> <laughs> Good, and guys, definitely check it out. I mean, it's life-changing. And um, first of all, thank you so much you know, for doing this. Guys, I just wanna let you know that we are going to have another episode coming up soon where we're actually going into Mark Fisher Fitness and make it very, Magical. Jazzy. Or jazzy, okay. Enchanted. <laughs> yes, it will be amazing. Um, I'm super excited about it. And then where can people find you right now? Uh, best place to find me is, if you're looking to find me personally, you can find me at mfisherfitness on Instagram. Markfisherfitness.com is MFF. Businessforunicorns.com is the place to find out anything about our courses. Mm -hmm. If you like this information, you can find a lot of similar free content on our blog. And if you want to see me say words somewhere, most of my time is spent on a traveling road show, speaking about a lot of the stuff we spoke on here, you can go to markfisherhumanbeing.com and that has my speaking calendar. Uh, admittedly, this year is coming to an end, so unless you're in Australia, I'm probably not gonna catch it this year, <laughs> but next year it'll be starting soon. I love that website, that sounds cool. Thanks, yeah. man. <laughs> Anyways, thank you so much. Hey, pleasure to Thanks yeah. for having me. Thank you. And thank you guys, make sure to watch the video Share it, love it, give it some love, rate it, because I think this was an amazing episode. He did amazing and they're full of golden nuggets. So thank you so much. Bye humans.